This is the story of Lufthansa Flight 527. On the 26th of July, 1979, a Lufthansa Cargo 707 was in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, prepping for a flight to Dakar, Senegal. The 707 was manned by three pilots, and they were fresh and ready for the Atlantic crossing that was about to come. At 9.05 p.m. local time, the plane taxied to runway 27. As they taxied, they changed over to the tower frequency. The controller instructed them to climb to 2,000 feet and to perform a right-hand turn towards the Caxias VOR after takeoff. At 9.27 p.m., the 707 took off. The pilots got in touch with departure and said, we are passing 1,500 feet and bound to Caxias. The controller acknowledged and said, turn right heading 040, turn right heading 040, and maintain 2,000 feet until further advice, LH 527. Increase your speed if feasible. Flight 527 obliged. On the radar scope, the controller could see that the plane was turning to comply with the controller's requests. At that point, the plane was just 2.5 nautical miles to the northwest of the airport. Over the next few seconds, the pilots progressively increased the speed of the 707 till it was at 304 knots. By the time they had sped up, the plane was 10 nautical miles away. Now, ATC wanted Flight 527 to turn to 160 degrees, and they wanted Flight 527 to climb faster at a rate of 3,000 feet per minute. In the dark skies over Brazil, the 707 now began to climb, and a sense of normalcy that was in the cockpit was shattered by a GPWS warning. The plane was telling them that they were headed right for terrain. This prompted an immediate reaction from the crew. They commanded max power from all the engines. They pulled back in an attempt to avoid hitting the terrain. But despite their fast reactions, they were not fast enough. The underside of the left wing contacted the trees as it was climbing away. The crash site was 13 nautical miles away from the airport and a place known as the Serra dos Macacos. None of the three crew members on board made it. The trees stood there as silent witnesses to what had happened. The cuts made on the tree showed how the plane came in. Each tree showed a progression in damage as the left wing cut into each and every one of them. The main wreck of the plane was 800 meters away or 2,600 feet away. Studying the wreck, they could find nothing wrong with the plane itself. It was airworthy and it was properly configured for this flight. They looked to see if the cargo had been loaded improperly. Improperly loaded cargo, or cargo shifting mid-flight, can cause major problems as far as controllability of the plane is concerned. But in the case of Flight 527, they found nothing to show cargo-related issues. They then decided to look at air traffic control itself to see if they had made any mistakes. The investigators found that the departure pattern for runway 27 from Rio's Galeo Airport was quite complex. Remember how they had to take off, turn to the right, and then stay at 2,000 feet? Well, that was done to keep Flight 527 away from another plane that was landing at Santos Dumont International Airport nearby, and another plane that was on the right downwind leg for runway 27. You see, Rio's Galeo Airport and Rio Santos Dumont Airport are quite close by. So close, in fact, that the outbound pattern from Galeo's runway 27 and the inbound pattern of Santos Dumont overlap quite a bit. So when runway 27 was being used, planes had to adhere to strict restrictions to maintain separation from other planes that might be in the area. To make this whole situation work, approach control at Galeo needed to coordinate a lot with other entities to keep planes safe. This meant that planes taking off from Galeo would be under strict altitude restrictions till they passed the area of conflict, and then they could climb to avoid high terrain in the area. This sounds complex, and it is. Such stringent restrictions demanded quite a bit from all involved, from pilots to air traffic controllers. You had to make sure that you were far away from the inbound traffic of another airport, and you had to coordinate a lot with them. It's a lot, and it added quite a bit of workload on the controllers. Now, amidst all of this, the investigators found a potential misunderstanding in the communications between the pilots and ATC. 
Remember how the pilots had to turn right and fly to the Caxias VOR? Before takeoff, the pilot wanted to know if he should turn to 093 degrees once he got to the Caxias VOR because that was a step in the departure procedure that they were following, which was called climb procedure number 16. But his question got no reply. The controller just asked the pilot to fly to the Caxias VOR and to maintain the climb. But his question was not answered. This conversation took about four minutes, but in that four minutes, the traffic situation had drastically changed. At around the time of Flight 527's departure, there was another plane that was on final approach to runway 27, and so Flight 527 was under an altitude restriction in case the inbound plane needed to go around or something. But the other plane landed safely, and so Flight 527 wouldn't have to stay at 2,000 feet but the tower did not tell the approach controller this, and so Flight 527 stayed at 2,000 feet after it had taken off when they really didn't have to do that. The lack of coordination between the tower controller and the approach controller would put Flight 527 in a precarious position. So after takeoff, due to this lack of information flow, Flight 527 was limited to under 2,000 feet when it should have been allowed to climb this is where mistake number two crept in. After takeoff, the controller said, increase your speed if feasible. Now, that is correct. Asking the plane to speed up was the correct thing to do, but he forgot one very important thing. He did not give them a target speed. Now, usually, you are not supposed to go above 250 knots when you're below 10,000 feet, but this controller did not specify that. The pilots took it to mean that they were not under any speed restrictions anymore. So they sped up and they went well past the limit of 250 knots all the way up to 304 knots. Right now, this plane is flying really low and it's flying way faster than the controller thinks it is. They were headed right for a tall mountain and they did not know about it. They were unaware of the danger that they were in. Right at this moment, the controller was dealing with four other planes in the area. Two of them needed his immediate attention as there was a potential traffic conflict brewing. This was to the south and he did not pay attention to the northern sector where Flight 527 was. At this point, the controller was radar vectoring multiple planes. Radar vectoring takes a lot out of you mentally. You have to be aware of where the plane is, where it's heading, what other planes are in the area, obstacles, course, etc. And this controller was doing that for multiple planes. Making matters worse, the controller's assistant, who should have been helping him out, was actually doing work that should have been done by the final approach controller. This meant that the departure controller had an enormous workload on him. He was vectoring five airplanes at once without an assistant. As he did all of this, Flight 527 was flying faster than he expected, covering more ground than he thought it would, and it was headed right for a mountain. That's the way it was for about 1 minute and 41 seconds. There was no talk between the controller and the plane. In the cockpit, they were having doubts about the speeds that they should be at. The captain says, quote, increase speed, he only said, end quote. They were debating that the speed that they should fly at. In addition to that, they were also referring to charts which had minimum safe altitudes of the area. But the captain thought that they were to the south of where they actually were, and they did not realize the severity of the situation. Finally, when the controller turns his attention back to Flight 527, they're further north than he expected them to be due to their higher speed and a 13-knot tailwind. He immediately asked them to climb, but it's too little too late. The mountain is already upon them. This accident really should not have happened. This could have been easily avoided if people had just talked to each other. When Flight 527 took off, it didn't need to be under an altitude restriction. They could have just followed climb procedure number 16 and the captain would have turned away from the mountain way before they even got close to it. Here's my question for you though. Many people say that this accident was a result of an error on the controller's part. On the surface, that seems to be right. The controller took too much time to realize what was happening. But was that really his fault? 
He was handling way more planes than regulation limits allowed him to, and he was doing that without the assistance of his assistant. On top of that, he was coordinating with a whole host of controllers, making sure that his traffic did not interfere with anyone else's inbound traffic. That's a lot to ask of one man. So the question is, was this a failure on the controller's part or a failure of the system that employed the controller? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to watch more mini air crash investigation, then how about this video about NX Adria Flight 1308? Link on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.